You are listening to Sean Kelly Interviews, a presentation of Sean Kelly on Movies at www.skonmovies.com. Now, here is your host, Sean Kelly. Hello, and welcome to a pre-holiday edition of Sean Kelly Interviews. Today, I will be focusing on the um, Canadian body horror film, Life Changer, which will be having a one-week engagement beginning on December 28th in Toronto, Ottawa, and Calgary, and I got on the line with the film's writer and director, Justin McConnell, to talk about the film, which uh, coincidentally, or not, takes place during the holidays. So I'm going to get right to my interview for Life Changer. So uh, probably um, start by asking if you could talk about the timeline about how Life Changer came to be and how it took present over the other feature films you were developing. Sure. Uh, so in 2014, I was getting frustrated with how long it was taking to put together a couple of larger projects, Trek and uh, The Eternal, which I've been trying to get made for quite a while. So I still try to brainstorm what I, how I could make something with a much, much lower budget around the level of the collapse or maybe just a little bit more. Something I could put together with my own sort of pocket change or finance or whatever uh and that through that process i was sitting on a bus one day and the idea hit me what if i saw myself out in public which of course is denise Villeneuve's enemy but from there it kind of organically grew into what the basic idea for life changing was uh and then in addition to that um i've, I've been going through a lot of uh self-examination and doubt and depression and uh existentialism and just like Looking inward, trying to find my place in the world, uh, sort of started a couple of years early, earlier when my uh, a, a very close friend and um, writing partner of a decade uh, passed away. So uh, that kind of informed the tone the script took when I started writing. Uh, and, and the, so that was great 2014. Uh, and then in early 2015, Abby Federgreen came to the table. He, he was the producer on it, uh, and we started instead of trying to do it on pocket change, we started to go out to real money. So we tried to get some telephone finance. Uh, that didn't quite pan out after about seven months. Uh, and then in 2016, we had other investors at the table who will remain nameless, who eventually walked away before production and uh, went off to make a completely different uh, genre horror film that played Fantasia in 2017. Uh, but we will not mention who they are. And then in in uh, 2017, we finally found the partners we were looking for in Raven Banner on Court, and we ended up going to production that fall, uh, started shooting in November 2017. Um, and through that whole time, I had been working on the script and rewriting and getting notes and just uh, getting as camera ready as possible ahead of when production was going to start. So that extra time in development and finding money, I think, helped us out. Okay, so um, what were some of your influences on the story for Life Changer? I personally know it's a big, like, David Cronenberg influence. Yeah, I mean, uh, the body horror and stuff, obviously. Uh, there, there's uh, DNA in old uh, David Cronenberg films, uh, of course. But I, I would say, and I say this, I don't have a date that I write. Um, I, like, just like a musician has influences, but you can't necessarily say, okay, that's from this and that's from that. I, of course, I grew up watching... Uh, body jumping films and, and you know shape shifting films like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Thing, The Hit, The, uh, the First Power, Fallen, The Borrower, things like that. Uh, I, that's all sort of part of my history in terms of watching and absorbing. So that's all knocking around in my mind. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure if I could pinpoint one film that would have influenced this this one to come into being because the story did really did feel like it came out of me sort of naturally. But absolutely, the uh, there's there's influences from films like that um, in this for sure. And uh, I, I I would be remiss to say or remiss to to not say or owe that I owe something to to having watched that stuff and or. Uh, the books I might have read, or whatever else, um, it's absolutely a possibility, uh, or absolutely part of the what made up this story. But a lot of it also came from very personal places, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's hard for me to pinpoint it, like any one or two things. But absolutely, there's of the fabric of the story. There's there's like, like patches from all over all over media. 
So could you talk about the casting for the film and how you maintained consistency when it came to different forms of the shapeshifter? Sure. So we uh, had Ashley Hallahan do that casting. We uh, got a whole bunch of self-tapes from all over the business, uh, people from southern Ontario who were non-union, because uh, it's a non-union film. Uh, and then of those tapes, uh, a few of them were people we already knew about, like uh, Laura Burke was uh, in Poor Agnes, which is was a very, she was very good as a serial killer in the film. Uh, Jack Foley was was shot uh, and, and the lead in a film called Fugue that Abby Pettigrew had produced uh, that was shot before Life Changes, so Abby had suggested that I, I take a look at this guy, so we had him read. Um, and Owen Tobacco I'd worked with before, but I also have been a, like a good friend with for uh, I don't know, six years now, seven years, something like that, and uh, I kind of wrote the part sort of with her in mind, uh, but she still read um, that she still, and so we still had to go through the whole audition process. Uh, there were other people, too, who I had sort of in mind for roles that didn't end up getting roles ultimately because I um, I got a loan of this project. I had eight, eight producers giving opinion as, opinions as well, and we really we did just want the best performers for the roles. So that's how we found Sam White and uh, Steve Kassan, all the other all the new Steve existed, uh, and Rachel Van Duzer and a lot of the rest of the cast. So once we heard the cast picked out, uh, I, I sort of gave everybody a, a full history of who the character is, uh, where they've been in life, so that the actors could kind of internalize that. And then we had something called the Drew Boot Camp, where we all just sort of sat around a boardroom table for a few hours and just talked about the character and came up with as a group, came up with common ticks and, uh, and things that made sense at a logical level of, of, of shared ways of walking, uh, you know, um, specific things that would tie, physically tie the performance uh, together without stepping on the interpretation of the character for each individual actor so that they, they could be as natural as they wanted to be as long as they were about specific things. And I think that helped unify it. But on set, we tried as hard as we could to sort of unify the performance and then in post particularly... Uh, when we were editing it, we, we, I had to be really, really conscious of making sure that the character, that it felt like Drew across all the different forms. So any any bit of performance that looked like it stepped outside of that character and was a little different got cut out of the movie. Yeah, so also in terms of um, casting, um, what were some of your choices to play the voice of Drew before you settled on Bill Oberst Jr.? Well, I wouldn't call we, I wouldn't say we settled on Bill Oberst Jr. He, I'm very glad we have him. He's a, <laughs> he's a hell of a great voice. Uh, but when we first went out casting and looking for the voice, the first voice was Peter Higginson. Uh, he was, uh, he's actually in the film, uh, at later on, but he, uh, I was originally going to use him as the voice. Uh, but what had happened during post-production is we realized two things. One of them was that Peter is a hell of an actor, but he's got, this kind of Scottish broke to him, this uh, very proper, and, and, and it felt, it made Drew as a character feel very, too, almost too much, too other, like too removed from the rest of the film uh, and the world of the film, that it, it just didn't, he didn't feel, uh, natural is the wrong word, he, he didn't feel, um, some of the sympathy got, got taken away. But the other big thing that happened was we ended up rewriting all of the inner voice during the whole production process, and it ended up turning into this more noirish kind of thing. So we wanted a voice that fit that kind of voiceover, that kind of tone. So we went out, we got a casting director from LA, Valerie McCaffrey, and we started going out to pretty big people. Like we tried for Tom Waits, we tried for uh, Michael Rooker, and Michael Rooker actually expressed interest at one point, but he kind of came in after Lance Hendrickson had already said yes. Uh, so Lance Henderson said yes, we were going to use him, and then SAG came in, uh, the Screen Actors Guild in the U.S., and said we weren't allowed to use any SAG members because we approached the, the union during post-production and not before we started shooting, which was a big big pain in the ass because it was a voice role. So we weren't allowed to use anybody in SAG, uh, so the next step would, would had to be finding somebody who was either non-union or SAG FICOR. And SAG FICOR is um, basically SAG members who left the union but are still allowed to work both union and non-union jobs. And luckily, uh, Bill is SAG FICOR. So he, we found a really great voice who was in a sweet spot between union and non-union that kind of, um, now that he's done it, and, and after he like did his first little bits of reads and stuff, I couldn't think of anyone else being the voice of three at this point, but we... Like we 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 uh, we inquired about like Burt Reynolds before he died. We 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 tried to get 
we tried to go after like a celebrity kind of voice, uh, but somebody with the right kind of uh, what Bill brought to the table, absolutely. Um, but we we did go through a list of people uh, that we weren't allowed to use because of SAG and some who just passed uh, on the project and stuff like that. But other than that, uh, yeah, yeah, I couldn't be happier with Bill. Uh, and I'm a little sorry to Peter. It's just that it didn't work out the way it, 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 we wanted it to, but it was really all about just what was best for the film. I kind of noticed, like, on the second time I've viewed the film, that the, the narration kind of, like, has a similar tone to the narration that's in the Christmas story. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a tiny bit, like an evil version of a Christmas story. Uh, absolutely. And, um, and that leads to my next question. Though. Was there any specific reason you decided to set the film during the holidays? Uh, well, there's a few reasons. Uh, the basic one, one basic one, is I really quite like Christmas horror. I, uh... I make a point of it every year of like watching as much Christmas horror film as I can, including trying to find new stuff. Um, so that's a basic idea. But it's not really a Christmas horror film. It's just a horror film that takes place over Christmas. The other is the kind of one of the reasons Shane Black uses Christmas uh, in a lot of his films. Uh, one, because it's uh, statistically one of the most depressing times of the year for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, suicide rates are higher. It's, uh, it's a very... Um, thematically it kind of fit the mood of the movie uh, but the other one the big one is it allows you to buy a whole bunch of creative and different lighting to fill the background with uh, and to fill your your space with so you could turn a lot of not super expensive sets and they're really nice looking sets on camera just by a string up a bunch of Christmas lights and putting up Christmas decorations for now uh, setting stuff at Christmas allows you to really amp up your lighting game for very very low money uh, so yeah those, those are the main reasons so, um, Life Changer is very much a Toronto story, and the Monarch Tavern is almost a character in itself. So, um, sure. how important was it for you to not hide the fact that the film takes place in Toronto? Hmm? Uh, I think it was pretty important. I, I, a lot of Canadian films try to be the United States, and one of the classic examples that everyone laughs at is uh, in Black Christmas, how they just shove like tiny little American flags on the desks in the police station, and everyone laughs about it in Canada because it's like, this is the most Canadian movie possible, but they, they just try to, you know, sneak, make it, for the American market, make it seem like an American movie. Um, I, the last two features I've done, I've been very, very direct in showing that it's Toronto. But I try not, when I'm showing Toronto, I'm trying not to show the touristy version of Toronto. I'm trying to, like, make it feel gritty and uh, shooting places where art, that maybe aren't as visually clean as a, a lot of how Toronto was shown on camera. That being said, if you go through the history of movies shot in Toronto, there are lots of really cool, like the silent partner, and uh, um, there's lots of cool stuff that was shot here that kind of has that aesthetic, and that's what I was kind of going for. In terms of actually setting it in Toronto, I have to set it in a city, right? And there's that whole idea that if your place takes place, or if your movie takes place no, in, in some generic nowhere, then, you know, the, the movie doesn't really take place anywhere. Uh, that being said, I tried, I didn't really, like, people are going to recognize it's Toronto, and there's a couple, like, there's a mention of, uh, uh, I forget where, um, anyway, there, there's a mention of, like, uh, one of the northern suburb type areas in dialogue at some point, but, um, I think it during a news broadcast, but beyond that, I, I said it there as the backdrop, but I did over the say thing, like, hey, we're in Toronto, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's meant to be, uh, there is the environment and the atmosphere, the way that it's portrayed, but it's not overtly like, uh, oh, I, this has to be a Toronto movie. It just so happens it's way easier to show the city to it properly and, and without hiding things if you're not trying to turn it into something else. Yeah, I think the film only has like one shot of the CN Tower. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, I'm not sure if people who live outside of Toronto will know what the Monarch Tavern is. <laughs> no, no, no. And the Monarch was, the Monarch's very friendly to film in first of all. So for a movie production like ours, their downstairs bar isn't actively running. So that's the big, that's a big challenge for filmmakers when you need to shoot the bar and you don't have a lot of money, is that most bars are open all day long. And if you want to shoot there, you have to pay them a lot of money because they have to shut their business down. The, one of the big benefits of the Monarch is their upstairs bar is open all day long. So you end up with a little bit of noise problem, but the downstairs bar is a reserved event, event space that is only full when there's an event. So we were able to 
to book that off for very, very cheaply and uh, and design it however we wanted to design it and with no worry about uh, customers needing to come in or the bar losing money. So that was good. That was the, the main reason we picked the Monarch. Then it was on a thematic level because I had this sort of like butterfly that keep going through the whole film and it's literally called the Monarch. Ah. Yeah. So, um, uh, what's uh, next for you and maybe could you provide us there something on what happened with Crap Word Jungle? <laughs> Oh, well, nothing happened with it. It's, it's currently in post-production, and it, but it became bigger. So Kevin Burke is now on board as an editor with me. Kevin Burke uh, directed 24 by 36. He's a very talented editor. The problem was is that uh, I got so much footage that it, making just one feature film out of it wouldn't be fair. Like, I shot 120, 125 interviews with people all over the business. There's so much great information there. So at, at a certain point, it expanded, and it became a feature film plus an eight-episode digital series. So the feature film itself is a Cockroach Jungle. For those who don't know, Cockroach Jungle survives the independent film business is a film school in a box kind of thing where I wish it existed maybe 15 years ago for me where people can watch the series and the, and the movie and get a ton of information and then eventually there will be a whole bunch of uh, additional website content and YouTube clips and stuff like that. I've got so much footage, it's just getting it done and edited while I'm also simultaneously you know, finishing a tour with a light changer or doing my client work that actually keeps my bills paid because I don't really have a ton of finance for Clapo Jungle. I, I did a small crowdfunding a few years ago that I wish uh, I was able to deliver on sooner, but I, I didn't raise my goal on that. I, I, and after the Indiegogo fees, I only ended up with like four grand or something, uh, which helped the production continue, but uh, I was trying to raise a lot more than that. Um, beyond that, though, uh, I, I shot so much. I've been shooting so much that I've just got so much story and information to tell that I, I had to expand it. So we're in post and editing together 400 hours of footage into eight episodes and a, and a feature film takes time, uh, especially with my focus divided. So now, not luckily now with Kevin Burke on board, uh, we're moving ahead at a good clip, and the goal is to have it out by mid-2019 at this point. So that's that's it's taken a little longer than I, I hope the documentaries can be like that. Uh, and I continue shooting all this time too. I literally just shot uh, three of these while I was in LA last week. One with Sam Pinkstenberg, who's the director of the American Ninja, one of two, uh, Magic Force, you know, Breaking Two, Electric Boogaloo, um, Revenge of the Ninja. Uh, one with David Gregory, who won seven films, uh, and another with Sean Motley, who's my composer on a, lot, on a couple things. But um, Including life changer. Between that and all the other stuff, like uh, I, this month, I have to cut. I have to put all the special features for the life changer Blu-ray together, as well. It's just a ton. It's a ton of work for one person to do uh, with very little finance. So it's just taken a little longer to get it out to people than I'd hoped. Um, in terms of other things, we've got our anthology series with Little Terrors. We, we put out a, an anthology every year. We'll have one in 2019 as well. Um, I'm not sure what yet. Uh, we're, we're bouncing around exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're supposed to go to here on two features in the spring, Quirk of Cain, which is based on a novel called Cain, and uh, with that I've, I've co-written with Serena Whitney and uh, Sir Hat Karate is directing in Australia. And uh, Do You See What I See, which is the feature of the of a Christmas short that Serena and I did a couple of years ago, um, but taking the seed of an idea at the end of the show, we turned that into a really crazy feature of Christmas horror movie. Uh, we're supposed to be shooting both those in the spring. We'll see how the business pans out on that. But uh, beyond that, like I've got a pretty busy year coming up. Okay, yeah. that's it. Okay. <laughs> Short and sweet. Okay, well, uh, I hope people enjoy the movie, and thanks, Sean, for having me on board. Um, well, that's exactly short. Uh, it's like 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just thinking. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> good stuff. All right, thank you. That was my interview with Justin McConnell for Life Changer. You will be able to see the film uh, theatrically beginning on December 28th at the uh, Carlton Cinema in Toronto, the Mayfair Theatre in Ottawa, and the Globe Theatre in Calgary. The film will also be released on VOD across North America on January 1st, followed shortly thereafter by a Blu-ray DVD release. So that's it for this edition of Sean Kelly Interviews, and I'll see you next time. Sean Kelly Interviews is a production of Sean Kelly on Movies and is hosted by Sean Kelly. 
The music is Out of the Fog from the website podsummit.com. You can support Sean Kelly and get bonus podcasts at patreon.com slash skonmovies. And you can read Sean Kelly's writing at www.skonmovies.com.